Looking for something to chase away the winter blues? Well, let me sing you a little song I wrote. No, 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 Steve, just no. What he meant to say is you could join us with Fine Gardening All Access. We promise to sharpen your gardening skills, keep you entertained, no matter the weather. And an added benefit, no music from Steve. Go to finegardening.com to sign up for a free 14-day trial. But I actually worked in a great rhyme for All Access. No, not happening, Steve. Not happening. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. Just not always the same ones. I'm Steve Aiken from Fine Gardening Magazine. And I'm Danielle Sherry, also from Fine Gardening Magazine. And who the heck picked this topic? Dan- Dan- <laughs> Danielle did, and she will not let you change topics. So yeah. for, for, for some background, oh dear listeners... I set the topics, I ask Steve for input, and usually Steve just goes, yeah, 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 that's okay. I don't even think he looks at it. And then Steve, for the two weeks before we tape an episode, complains about said topic and asks who picked the topic. Um, The reverse happened this time because I struggled with this topic. (laughs) Well, okay, so everybody's hitting the fast forward button. So uh, (laughs) No skippers! What? What is the topic? This The topic is unusual bulbs. And this is fall planted bulbs for a spectacular spring show. So unusual bulbs. And uh, this topic made me realize I don't have or plant enough bulbs. Well, and let's, let's also kind of lower the expectations here because we're not going like really bizarre, freaky, but we're going past the basic daffodils, tulips, muscari. Yes. Um, yes. Not, not too far out. I mean, because th- those those bulbs are out there, but these are ones that we really want to recommend, um, mm-hmm. and they're they're not, they're not too freaky. Uh, they're, not, no. they're not botanical oddities. Um, they probably heard of of a lot of these, but we're we're mm-hmm. just going to recommend them as um, as good garden worthy bulbs. That's not just another yellow daffodil or giant red tulip that the deer are going to eat. You're not going to find tete-a-tetes on, you know, daffodils on here or, you know, I, I think we even went like one level even deeper than that. You know, we didn't have a single muscari on our list, did we? No, oh, okay. I, I, I could have, but like I, I didn't. Yeah, but, yeah, I did, yeah, but yeah. I, you know, I have a tulip, not to, you know. I have a tulip too. A spo- spoiler alert. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but a species tulip, right? Yes. 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 So yeah. And and we'll get into what that means and all of that, but what, okay. So did you didn't struggle with this? It, it feels like you sent your list in immediately to me and you did tweak one, but I, I, I tweaked one and there, there are some, what, you know, not too much inside baseball, but you know, I had to find a photo of these. Like there's a couple other ones I would have done, but I couldn't find a good photo yeah. uh, of them or, or um, a source. And, and there's, there's a couple that, um, I have grown and it's a great bulb, but it didn't really come back for me on a, you know, on a regular basis. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, so those I, I bypassed, but what I'd like to do is what, when I do buy bulbs is I try to buy something that I've never heard of before or something that's mm-hmm. a little out of the ordinary. So, I, so I do have some of these, um, See, you know, out of the ordinary. I'm- I'm just the opposite because I feel like I battle so much with having bulbs. You know, I battle deer. I battle. I have a rampant vole issue and we can get into that when when we discuss one of the bulbs. But, you know, even a lot of bulbs that are touted as, oh, yeah, these are vole resistant. I have not found that to be the case. So I feel like it's almost like I'm planting dollar bills in the ground Mm. and then only to see them decompose into nothingness. Um, The one exception I have is, you know, my alliums for the most part had been doing really well. And then uh, this past year I saw them unearthed with chunks taken out of them. So I I have a feeling either that was squirrels or bulls. I'm not really sure. Uh, I I just feel like I'm cursed when it comes to bulbs. So I I don't invest. But what about daffodils? They're supposed to be toxic. 
So daffodils are my one exception, and I do have those. I kind of naturalize them along a wooded edge of our property. I don't really include them much in the uh, garden, which maybe I should, but I I guess I I got away from daffodils. And I saw some really cool, interesting daffodils online when I was researching this, but I don't grow them. I don't have experience with them, so I kind of put on the brakes to recommend them. I would recommend not adding daffodils to the garden. Just because, (laughs) well, you have to sit there and watch the foliage die. Yeah. You know, as most things are growing, you're just waiting for that thing to die so you can get rid of that that foliage. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's May and June. There's two months of waiting for foliage to die. And then, you know, it's flopped over and it looks bad, but you still can't cut it back. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. And it's just, it's just, I think they're better for the, for the outer edges or for areas where you don't kind of mind that. And if you are going to add daffodils uh, to the garden, then you plant them behind something that's going to grow up like an ornamental grass or something. Ornamental that's gonna, grass, yeah. Or maybe right. a daylily or something like that. Pastas. You know? I, yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. So, all right. We talked about what we didn't recommend. So give me your mm. first plant. Well, uh, my first one is not, uh, again, is not all that um, freaky, but usually when we're talking about alliums, you know, we're talking about the big globe master uh, mm-hmm. Alliums like the big purple balls, um, and there's there's such a huge variety in this in this genus. Uh, but one that that I like uh, is the drumstick allium. That's Allium spherocephalon, uh, and it's hardy from zones four to eight. Um, and you get you get that you know alliums have that round um, flower. You know, mm-hmm. like, it's like the size of a golf ball. Uh, but it's kind of elongated at the top, sort of like a troll head, you know, just a little, it's like round, but it's a little bit, it's like, you know, it's like you, you've seen those babies with the, the malformed head. It's a terrible thing to say, but it's just kind of, um, or maybe, maybe it's egg shape. It's egg shape. I should say, let's, let's say that. Yeah. You just described the flower as a misshapen baby head. <laughs> We're going to get letters. Yeah, we so are getting um, letters. Let's, um, let's, let's just go with egg shaped. Um, okay. Egg shaped. They're, they're, they're round to oval. You know, mm-hmm. and um, they they get about two feet tall, and the 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 plume itself is maybe only a couple inches wide, so it's like it's the size of a golf ball, maybe a little smaller than a golf ball. Uh, but it's this really nice red, um, and I, I was thinking about it, trying to describe the the color red. And as anybody who has listened to this podcast knows, I can't really describe color. It's 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 almost like a maroon, but not quite. Um, it's mm-hmm. somewhere in between red, purple, and maroon, like somewhere in that in that triangle um, is where these things sit. And so that yeah, you, you get these little um, red balls dancing, um, and they bloom a little later, uh, if I remember correctly. Like, I want to say midsummer, mid to late summer, no midsummer. Um, you know, which is unlike other other alliums. They bloom a little later, um, and they're just, they're just they're wonderful. They add these little red pops of, you know, dots, you know, to the, to the garden. Um, I grew them with some Carly Rose Penicetum, uh, which is a fountain grass and it's, it's bloom has a little red um, tinge to it. Um, and, and they just look great. Um, you have to grow them in a, in a, in a group. You can't, you know, like with some alliums that have big balls that have large blooms on top. Um, you can, you can space them out in the, in the bed. These should, these should be grouped together in like a nice mass of like, you know, seven or eight, you know, mm-hmm. um, but really, really easy to grow. Um, and I got, I got maybe like five or six years out of them. And then they, I think they gradually declined because they weren't getting enough sun. Um, they're, they're planted underneath a tree. And as that tree gradually grew, these gradually faded out. So, mm-hmm. um, but really easy to grow. Um, why go with the, the, the well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the big purple alliums, but this one's a little, a little different. Um, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's almost a, a completely different look. It gives you more of that, you know, serendipitous look to it instead of, you know, like Allium Christophi or Globe Master is like, boom, there's yeah. your Allium Bloom. So I like the color of these a lot better too. How, how would you describe that color? I think like a, a dark purpley maroon. I, I, I thought I was right. I, Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. that you were spot on with that because, yeah, it's definitely not, you know, you think alliums and you think that lavendery purple color, you know, um, and sometimes a little bit into the pinks. But no, this is a dark maroon. This is a more sophisticated allium, I would say. I, I like it. And and uh, for those of you who go to the website to look uh, for a picture of this, the, the picture I provided for this shows my drumstick allium with the Carly Rose 
um, penicetum on it and uh, standing on top of a caryopteris. And I just, mm. I, I like that as proof that I once grew caryopteris. I think it's a Worcester gold. Oh, uh, yeah. So like I saw it, I'm like, hey, look, I did grow caryopteris. I do remember <laughs> that right. Yeah. In, in case you're listening to these episodes out of order, uh, I recommend a Caryopteris almost every single episode, um, or at least every other episode, because that's my favorite plant, Steve well knows, or my favorite genus, should I say. Um, so ironically, I did an allium too. Um, I feel like that's my best bet, or historically, I thought that that was my best bet with as many vole issues as I have and as many critter issues as I have for fall planted bulbs. So um, I did Allium oreophyllum. And the whole time I was chuckling because I was practicing the the Latin name and thinking, oh, it's Oreo. Steve will like it. It's a big yeah. good. Yeah. So, so I'm assuming this is, this has like a dark outside with like a white, like inside the blooms. <laughs> No, not at all. Not at all. I, I don't know why. I don't uh, know why. It's not a bicolor at all. It's its common name is pink lily leek. Um, but yeah, it's it's Allium oreophyllum. It's zones four to nine, so it's pretty tough. And it gets 12 to 18 inches tall, so not huge. Um, gotta say, my experience, 12 inches. It maxes out at about 12 inches. This is a tuffet kind of a mound of thicker bladed blue green foliage um kind of what you would assume from an onion um because it's in the onion family and you know you get that tough and that kind of is the first thing that you see for april into may and then towards the end of may it sends up about these you know 6 inches or so tall thin wiry stems that get covered in clusters of pink, bright pink magenta star flowers, but they all bind together into this one, maybe slightly larger than a golf ball size bloom. So pink lily leek, obviously it's pink flowers. Um, and they're just, it's very pretty. It looks it looks like it, what you would expect an allium bloom to be, but a little bit looser. You know, it's it's a little, it's not as tight and drum sticky as a lot of all other alliums are. Um, and it's long bloomed too. So not only does it bloom late spring, early summer, but it lasts for a few weeks. Um, it's not just a one and done situation. And then you get those cool seed heads afterwards, which your allium does too. You know, it kind of persists as this interesting seed head that kind of is sculptural in the garden. Um, also, you know, this is a pollinator magnet. I, I notice it in early spring that it's usually covered with a plethora of bees um, and other, you know, um, good insects, we'll say. Uh, being that it's an allium, it's deer resistant um, and usually bunny um, and gopher resistant as well. However, you know, I, I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed because I've noticed some damage and we were, we were talking about this, that some of my allium bulbs of my larger alliums were unearthed this spring and had some chunks taken out of them. I don't know if that's voles. My speculation is it might be chipmunks or squirrels because they go absolutely bananas in the spring and unearth everything looking for their nuts. Um, but, I, you know, it's still... Alliums are still usually a safe bet for me. And I just really love this um, pink lily leek um, allium oreophyllum. And it looks nothing like Oreo cookies. Sorry, Steve. No. <laughs> have, you, uh, have you grown this guy? No, no. no? It's a new one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it's pretty nice. Um, full sun and well-drained soil. And I feel like, you know, maybe I should just say that as a disclaimer for nearly all of my bulbs. Full sun, well-drained soil. <laughs> That's what they want. So what else you got, Steve? Well, you know, everybody loves tulips. There's really nothing to not love about tulips other than the fact that the deer eat them and they don't reliably come back. Mm -hmm. um, but the sight of tulips, like there's no one, no one thinks tulips are ugly. No, uh, everyone I likes can't. to see it. Yeah. Everybody loves to see tulips in spring. Um, but it's, it's the not. It's so not returning that is the big factor for me because, like, like you said, it's like planting dollar bills. Um, it's spending a lot of money and doing a lot of you know hole digging for an annual. Mm -hmm. um, but supposedly, species tulips are more likely to come back and to and to return for you. So if the if the tulip has a species name, it's not one of the um, you know uh, highly bred 
uh, cultivars, it's more likely to come back for you. Mm -hmm. Plus, they're they're a lot more interesting looking than you know your your, your basic tulip. Um, so I, I experimented. Um, and I bought uh, Tulipa Clusiana Lady Jane. That's Lady Jane Tulip. Um, and I have been wonderfully uh, thrilled with, with her. Um, it's it's um, it zones four to eight. And the flower is pointier than a regular tulip. Normally we think of tulips as kind of like that cup shape, although there are some some pointy ones. This one's this one's pointier. So it's um it's you know it's round at the bottom and comes to a point at the top. Um, and the, the petals, the flowers, when they're closed on the outside of the petals, there's like a, uh, it's a, it's a soft red, uh, with, with a white edge on the outside and they, they look amazing. And then in the sun, they, they open up and it's all white on the inside. It's a really wonderful show. And then at night they, they close back up. Um, so it's, it's just a stunning spring show with these really soft, uh, but noticeable colors. They like, they, they don't get lost, uh, at, at all in the spring uh, sunshine. They, they come up pretty early. Um, I want to say for us like April. So like I would say early spring, um, they get about a, a foot tall. Uh, that's, that's about how tall my owner I'm going on three years with mine and, and they have not skipped a beat. And they're, they're so wonderful that uh, I'm always taking pictures of them and I'm always posting them on, on social media, you know, like, look, look at me, look at this cool tulip I have. You guys all have the basic tulip, but I have this cool, you know, two, two-tone version. Uh, oh, it's just Tulip uh, Clusiana, Lady Jane. Yeah. Um, but everyone always asks me like, what is that? Oh, that's striking. That's amazing. And it's just, it's just going, taking a step beyond the basic tulip to some of these more, these wonderful cultivars, these species tulips. Um, but Lady Jane is just, she just, she's, she's so attractive and charming in spring when I really need it most, you know, like are, are things coming back? Is anybody coming back? And then I have my reticulated iris come back first. And then like, oh, I should be seeing Lady Jane soon. And she, I have ever planted in clumps. Again, this is another bulb that's, and I think most bulbs are best planted in, in clumps and masses. And yeah. I, I, I have her in three different, three different clumps. Uh, around and it's just it's just so wonderful to to see her come up every spring it's it's uh telling that i was you know surfing around on our website finegardening.com and saw that andy pulte who's down in tennessee recommended that as one of his favorite bulbs <clears throat> excuse me and um all the way up to andy keys who's in massachusetts uh recommended that as one of his favorite bulbs so obviously this this lady jane she's got legs she uh she is well loved by many well loved by many um i have a species tulip okay. and it's wild orange tulip it's tulip orphan idea uh, O-R-P-H-A-N-I-D-E-A, -E uh, otherwise known as also the Spartan Tulip. I saw this for the first time at NYBG many, many years ago. It might have been one of my first photo shoots with Fine Garden, Fine Gardening. Um, and it has strappy grass-like foliage. It was actually shooting up from a massive ground cover of Basket of Gold, um, Ariana. And it was beautiful it had this long almost nine inch stem and at the end of it uh it was this yellowish goldish tulip that had red tips to it thinner um definitely not bulky a little more delicate and refined looking um thin arching stem it was just really really beautiful and it captured my attention it also uh, is a species tulip, as we were talking about, so a little bit rarer. Um, I did purchase uh, some bulbs of this. I did plant it out of my package of bulbs, which was probably, I don't know, six or seven bulbs. I have one that made it uh, several years later and one that still comes up in my garden. It actually comes up through a mass of creeping thyme, um, which is kind of nice because it hides that ugly green, uh, you know, easily brown at the tips foliage sometimes that happens to tulips as they as they start to go by. But um, full sun to part shade, fertile, well-drained soil for this girl, um, four to eight, zones four to eight. So um, pretty wide wide range. Uh, I, I really, I just, I liked it. It was my first experience with 
a, a species tulip. And uh, so far, so good. A little bit larger than than your Lady Jean. Um, and again, that's wild orange tulip, tulip orphan, orphan idea. Um, so is, is it actually <laughs> orange? It's, you know, here's the thing. It's yellow and red. So, you know, the sun shines through it and it looks a little bit orange. So it's definitely something that's really kind of cool. I don't think it's actually orange. It's just that color combo makes it look orange, which is kind of neat. But that's pretty cool for spring because normally orange is like a fall color. And in spring, you get a lot of the pastels, the purples and the blues. So to have that color and to have it not be an in-your-face orange at that time of year could be pretty striking. I have I have a I have a neighbor who has a um actually two neighbors are right across the street from one another. They both have orange azaleas. Mm-hmm. And they bloom like this bright obnoxious orange. Like I can't help but like you know driving down the street to turn and, and look at these things. And they're they're a little you know, far away, but like I look at them every time because they're screaming orange, you know, in springtime. And it's just to me it's just a little too it's it's too much. Uh, yeah. but this sounds like it's it's just the right amount. You it know. is. It's nice. And, you know, like, especially because it is that it's that yellow and red combo. So the yellow looks really good with some other things like daffodils, like the basket of gold ground cover, like, you know, my variegated creeping time. It looks pretty good with that. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan. So we're moving right along. We've done two alliums, two tulips. Do, do you have a fritillaria? I do not. Okay. All right. So do your next one. <laughs> uh, well, my next one is is actually it's a it's a North American it's a Pacific Northwest uh, native bulb, uh, okay. which is kind of it's I don't know why, but North American bulbs seem to be a little rare. They seem to be more common yeah. on the West Coast than they are on the East Coast. But maybe I just haven't searched um, long and hard. Uh, but you know, usually in the spring, I walk around and look at other people's bulbs, and I say, "Oh, I should have planted bulbs last fall." Oh, you know, and like. I've been enjoying, you know, everybody's daffodils and tulips. I'm like, oh, I really should, you know, and it's it's past the season. And, and then I think, oh, wait, there's my Camassia. So Camassia uh, lectlinii, Blue Danube, uh, is is the Camassia I grow. Its common name is is either Camas or Quamash. Uh, it's, 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 it's a Native American word. Uh, so I go with Blue Danube Quamash as the, um, as the common name. Uh, but Camassia is the uh, is the Latin name. And this is a bulb that blooms a little bit later than most spring bulbs. I get mine, uh, I, I tend to think of it as, as a mid, you know, early to mid-May um, bloomer. And you get these tall grass, grass-like grass stems, um, but, you know, like a thick uh, um, grass blade. Um, and then, you know, like in, in mid-May, you get these, these tall stems, maybe like up to three feet, um, two to three feet. Mine are usually around two feet, uh, but I've I've seen reports three, even up to four. You get these long stems that are covered with with blue, these narrow blue stars. Uh, and blue Danube is is a really deep, intense blue um, with yellow stamens. I, I really like the combination of, of of purple and 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 gold. And this is as close as we we come to that in this. This this is a plant that we should have done on the true blue. Uh, mm-hmm. one and, and there's a couple of bulbs I came I came across like I should have done those on the, on the truth but it's uh it, you get these these little blue stars um, going up these these uh, uh long narrow stems and um you know the the yellow on the stamens stands out I'm not I'm not one to ever say you know oh oh look at the stamens on that thing like that's not a thing but it it, it, it adds this touch of yellow to to this deep blue um, really charming and really um really easy to grow. It, it likes things a little bit moister, apparently, than most bulbs. So most bulbs, at least the ones that I tend to grow, um, want a really dry summer. You know, they it's it's um, wet in fall, wet in spring, wet in winter. But that summer, they need to, to dry out because they're dormant. Otherwise, they're just going to rot. You know, they come from places that, that have really dry summers, like, like Turkey, you know, um, that's mm-hmm. where, where tulips are native to. But this is native to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, where where it, it can take and prefers it to be a little bit more moist. So if you have a spot that that stays moist throughout the year, um, or just doesn't you know isn't dry to the bone, you know like a like a tulip likes, uh, then this is a great plant for you. Um, zones three to eight, um, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a native to the northwest, and that's 
we don't recommend a lot of those. So I think that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> no. And the only time I've really ever seen this, you know, grown, grown in, in mass and grown to perfection has been out West. So it's, it surprised me that you had it in your garden, but you must have it in a, in a moist spot because I'd be out as soon as you were like consistently moist through the year. I'm like, yeah, there's no part of my garden that stays that way. Well, you know, I, I don't have a spot that's consistently moist. It's just, okay. it's just where it is. It just must not be. You know, under a lot of stress, well, like like totally dry, yeah. You know, in, in this in the summer, um, it there it just must be a like I don't provide any extra moisture to it. Okay. Um, I I knew when I first started growing it, it's a long time ago. I knew it was a native, but I thought it was an East Coast native. Oops. I did I didn't realize it was going to grow so like I'm like oh cool, um, um, because you know I. You know, when you hear when you hear like, you know, the Native Americans used to do this, um, we have we in, in New England have um, just a strong you know Native American, you know, like all the names of the, Connecticut is a Native American word. Wow. You know, where do you go to the beach? Meskwamakit, you know, yeah. like there's <laughs> there's like a, a strong uh, Native, um, you know, identity running through the, the area. So I just assumed it was it was Native to this to this region, but but it wasn't. Um, but I haven't given it any special care, or any special area, or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it's just very low maintenance. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So that's all you have to say is interesting. About I know I did. I didn't really have much else. I mean, I was just really shocked that it does well in your garden, which was yeah. which is well, cool. And, and and I and it sounds beautiful, but I was just like, yeah, I just thought hmm, I don't have. I don't have any condition in my garden that would be that would that would sustain that yeah. uh, so, bo- so, bone suppo- dry. <laughs> supposedly rodent proof. So, oh, all so, right. so your 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 spot should be great for, for most bulbs it that, is. That, that want that dry summer. You just need it's to find the-, the ones that the voles won't eat. Right. Or surround them in cages before planting. Yeah. Which exactly. Well, or, um, or b- bury them in gravel. That might that might do it. Yeah, I tried that. Yeah. The squirrels, the squirrels don't, the squirrels will dig right through gravel. That gravel does not bother the squirrels whatsoever. They are, they're crazy. I feel like I should do, you know, like those uh, America's Funniest Home videos. I could do that with the squirrels around my area just because we're in the middle of the woods. So they go, I, I think something snaps with them in the spring and they just go bananas and they just start digging up everything. I mean, you, I don't know if you remember this, but years ago they were digging in my window boxes. They never planted stuff in my window boxes, but it doesn't matter. They were digging it out and throwing stuff everywhere out of my window boxes. They're a little tapped. <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe somebody else planted, you know, dug something in there. Like they, don't, they don't care who buried it. They just need to find it, you know. Right. But exactly. as, 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 if you've ever watched a squirrel try to, try to um, you know, cross the road, they're not masters of decision making, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, they definitely are not. They definitely are not. Yeah, they're just a little tapped. I feel like my my squirrels are a little extra tapped. I don't know what happens to them, but anywho, maybe it's because they're eating my fritillaria bulbs. <laughs> which <laughs> so which are supposed to be um rodent proof because of their, yes. their odor, their skunk like odor. Yeah. Right. So um I you know I've had a love hate relationship with Fritillaria. Fritillaria imperialis, which is that pineapple looking one where it's, you know, orange bells and it's got this crazy SpongeBob pineapple under the sea thing going on. I don't like it. I think it's weird looking. Then you've got Fritillaria, uh, is it Melagerus, which is nearly agris, yeah. which is like a weird, it looks like a tulip got sent into like the Jetsons world and it came out purple with checkers all over it. Like, what is this? It's like, it's like a bad fashion move. Wait, wait, are you, are you dissing that plant? I is don't. Is it I, I think it looks so weird. It looks like it doesn't belong in nature. It's a tulip. It's a purple tulip with a checkerboard all over it. But it's it, it, so not, it hangs down. It's it's it's, it's so that, weird. That checkerboard, looking. that checkerboard pattern is is wonderful. It's so weird looking. I just couldn't get into it. But then, but then, I was at a, a, a garden. I think it was in Rhode Island. I can't remember. I was trying to look through my old photo shoots and I saw ivory bells, fritillaria, and that's fritillaria um, persica, ivory bells. And man, this looks like a foxglove. 
To me, from a distance, it was far too early for it to be a digitalis foxglove. But from a distance, I thought, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. A tall, two to three foot tall stem of these beautiful greenish ivory bell flowers um, up and down the stem. And ran over, took a look. No, this is not a foxglove. There's no way it is because it's too early in the season to be a digitalis, but it looks so much like that. It looks like a plant that should have been outside Beatrix Potter's cottage. You know, it's it's so beautiful. Um, the foliage is strappy, bluey green color, nothing much to write home about. Like most bulbs, you kind of want to surround it with something that bulks up so you don't see that foliage. It's not um, it's not all that attractive. This is zone six to eight. So I was excited. I would be able to grow it. Also, as you said, stinky bulb. So supposedly the voles and other, other critters will leave it alone. Um, planted a few of them, had moderate success. Um, it was an extremely wet winter the year that I planted them and they tend to resent a lot of extra moisture. Uh, they need it fairly dry. They, they are prone to rot. I don't know if that's what happened, but I was, I was pleasantly surprised with one or two came up and, and that was enough to keep me happy because they're so, so beautiful. Um, mid to late spring is when these guys bloom. Um, and just a a beautiful, beautiful plant Uh, and bulky two, two to three feet. I mean, that, that's pretty impressive for a, a bulb when you're used to, you know, maybe a foot tall tulip uh, in your world. So yeah, uh, it's it's the one fritillaria and that's fritillaria persica ivory bells. Yeah. Really like it. So I've grown, I've grown the straight species of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so a few years ago, we did a small department on fritillarias where I grew as many different types of fritillarias as I could. Um, I grew the straight species of that one. And even that is, uh, is great. It has um, much, uh, it's like, purple dark purple like not quite black but dark purpley plum plum with bluish (laughs) shades to it it's very moody and 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 dark um flowers to it just just great we got we got we got two years out of it the second year was kind of mm, um but uh just just absolutely stunning and the the way it holds its flowers it always looks like um if you ever go to a sporting event and look at the lights you know it always reminds me because it's got like these tears or these little like you know, round things hanging off of it. Uh, but but a great, great plant if you can get it to come back you yeah. know, year after year. And I think it just has to be happy and they are prone to rot. Um, and, they're you know, they're, you know, you get the recommendation to plant them on their sides and things like that. Um, but uh, but a, a great plant, you know, if you can get it in the right spot, you know, then it's, yeah. just, it's just perfect. I'd love to see the white one. I've never actually seen that one. So it's beautiful. Okay, so my my next plant. Uh, actually, we're we're going back final. to final yeah, plant. Okay, okay. Just, <laughs> this this will be it for me. We got to uh, wrap it up here. <laughs> okay, um, is it's actually a plant with a with a bunch of different names. Um, it it's actually has moved back into the Allium clan. Uh, so I'm going to go with the name Sicilian honey garlic, but you can also find this as Bulgarian honey garlic or Sicilian honey lily or Bulgarian honey garlic lily, you can find any version of that. Um, the Latin name is Allium siculum, subspecies Dioscordus. Oh. And you can find it as Allium siculum, Allium Dioscordus. Um, you can also find it as uh, Nectarosquartum siculum, subspecies Bulgaricum. And then you can you can interchange any of those species and subspecies and, and find it listed under that. And they may, in fact, actually be different plants, but they all look pretty much the same. Yeah, no, I'm going to go with Sicilian honey garlic. Which, That's which sounds great. With. That sounds great. Yeah. Everyone likes Sicilian honey and garlic. So, yes. Um, yes. But from zone six to 10, um, and uh, imagine an allium in your mind. Let's start with that as, as a jumping off point. Got it. Um, and in early summer, like uh, late, late May, uh, or, you know, early June, which to me is is summer. Um, <laughs> Not according to the calendar or well, anyone else, but Steve, late May, summer. Got it. I'm with you. Right. If you're starting to wear shorts and the school is wrapping up, it's summertime. Um, okay. So um, about three foot tall stems, 
you know, uh, coming up from from a, a, a base of allium type foliage. Um, I've never really measured, but they, they seem that tall. Um, and at the top of which um, uh, of these of these, uh, you know, instead of having like a ball, um, they have like these petioles that arch out and, and hold little pendant bells. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the end uh, of these bells, they kind of start out green and add stripes of white. Um, and purple, like like a thick purple stripe with you know with some white around the edges, um, and it kind of always holds on to that greenish tone. Um, and this sounds weird because it looks kind of weird, uh, but in a cool way. Uh, and they're they're very striking. So you get you get the, um, this, this ball with all these little um, you know bells shooting out from from the center ball, um, and they look they look amazing. And they're the type of thing that everyone always says, "Ooh, what's that?" You know, that's the type of thing um, that they are. And we just we just published this a couple of issues ago. This was in this was in a photo and everyone wanted to know what what was that plant? You know, yes. and I think we, we, we labeled it as, as nectar uh, uh, scortum when you know, it's actually allium. Same plant, different name. Um, and it's, it's just a super striking plant grows just as easy as every other allium you know, out there. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> All right, Steve. Well, we, we published this uh, a photo uh, with this plant in it. It was a wonderful combination of a garden in Seattle. And it, it has, you know, a bunch of hostas at the bottom. And there, here's this allium popping up from behind it. Uh, but this allium that is unlike anything we've seen. And everyone wanted to know, like, what is that? Uh, because it was striking, because it was cool. Uh, mm-hmm. And it, it's best planted like that where it's behind something. So you don't see this foliage. The, the foliage comes up first, then starts to brown. And then mm-hmm. the flowers come up. So you've got these cool flowers as a browning foliage at the bottom. So you want to hide that foliage. So you put it behind something. Um, yeah. And it's they're, they're really best you're popping up in the middle of a, of a border um, anyway. Um, and the plant smells like garlic, too, which is... Yum. Yeah, well, it's good, it's good for a while. But then after a while, you're like, okay, that's enough of that. Um, <laughs> I was, you know what? So it was funny because I remember... I forget we were doing, you know, headlines and and for this particular issue and that article came up and it was a shade article actually, yep. I'm pretty sure. And you know, we were back and forth and we we're trying to come up with what the what the headline should be and I was like, "Oh, these look like really strange plants." They look out of the ordinary strange plants for shade. And you go, "What? You've never heard of Sicilian honey garlic before. <laughs> it was like, no, no, yeah, I, never I think, heard of it. And how I think cool. It, at that point, we were still calling it Bulgarian honey garlic. Okay. So, <laughs> Bulgarian like, anything, you know, sounds um, exotic. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a really cool looking plant. And uh, I, I loved the fact that in this article, and I don't know, normally, I don't know if you said this, I'm sorry, I'm trying to be a good listener, but that it takes some partial shade. Um, yeah, it was- I think I think all alliums do it. Alliums tend to pop up in a lot of shade articles. I'm talking full shade, but right on yeah. that line between, you know, full, you know, to partial shade. Um, they, they seem to do just fine there because usually the foliage pops out, you know, sometimes before the leaves have leafed out so they can get the sun that they need and do their thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'd say partial so shade cool. to, to full partial, sun. Which is cool for bulbs. Cause that's a little bit more on the rare side. Um, yeah. all right. So I struggled, you know, with my last bulb, I, I was just, Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I don't have another unusual bulb, but um, I was going through some old SIPs um, that we did, special interest publications. I came across one that was a featured bulb, and uh, I think it was called Unusual Bulbs or something along those lines. And I came across this plant, Spring Star Flower, which is... um, Iphion uniflorum, Iphion uniflorum, zones five to nine. Um, It looked... You know, it looked like a bulb where I thought, oh, yeah, I've seen that a bunch of times. And then I looked a little closer and thought, maybe I've seen that a bunch of times. And then I looked at the name, Iphion uniform, and I thought, I don't think I have seen this a bunch of times. So I'm in I'm in the world of is this common? Is this a little less common? I'm not sure. I'm confused, but I liked it. <laughs> so what does so, it look like? 
So, all right, it is related to alliums again, but obviously a different genus. And it is a South American ground cover. So it stays relatively short, around 10 inches tall and wide. Has very, very green, almost grape hyacinth-like foliage to it, although the blades of the foliage are slightly thicker. Um, And then in mid-spring, it gets a plethora of white star flowers. And as those white star flowers start to fade, they get a slight bluish tinge to them. Very, very slight. Um, The thing that I liked about this bulb is that it tends to self-seed fairly readily and creates offsets of bulbs when I read about it. And I just thought, man, I like the look of a naturalized, you know, naturalizing bulbs where they kind of, you know, poke up underneath all of your larger shrubs and in between all the cracks and crevices. And this seemed like a bulb that you could plant that would do that on its own without you having to dig 47 million teeny tiny little holes to create a naturalized look with these bulbs. So um, zones five to nine, I'm not sure if I said that earlier. So it's got a large, fairly large range for its zonal hardiness. But again, that spring star flower and it's Iphion uniflorum. Have you heard of this guy? Yeah, you know, I've heard of it, um, but I've never grown it. It's it's one of those oh. things that I, I, I always see it in bulb catalogs. Um, mm. So, so to me, uh, on on those grounds, it's common, um, but I've never grown it, and I'm not sure if I've ever seen it grown. Um, just because I probably haven't been out in in, in various gardens at that time of year. Um, so, in that regard, it's 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 unusual. Um, I I think it's one of those bulbs that's like you you, you see them grown a lot in like florists and things like because they're they're easy to force. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and you might see them like sold like that, you know, like those little things that you people buy for and they take away and give to you in March. And it's like a little gift. And then it sits on your windowsill, <laughs> you know, it blooms and then it dies, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like it's like I think it's like one of those. Um, but I've always been tempted to to buy it. But then again, like what what bang am I going to get for my buck? there so is it just a teeny tiny little flower just a, so how much am i going to spend on these things how many holes do i have to dig you know for these like now nah, i can do i can do better with, with something else and so that's why i don't think i've ever pulled the trigger um but but then on, there's on the, that cool aspect that it kind of naturalizes itself so that was very tempting to me I, yeah I like, that, but that's, I like that sounds like the, that. that it reminds me of a uh, um star of bethlehem uh, uh originothalum which is an invasive mm-hmm. bulb um, which okay, I okay. Have... Hey, hey, hey. This is not an invasive. Don't don't start. Don't don't. We're going to get letters. I did well, not it... pick an invasive. <laughs> well, it's, it, you know, it, maybe it's not invasive yet. Um, but oh, no, like, it, just, it, just, <laughs> it just it reminds me of digging because uh, I have to dig out those those little bulbs like every spring. Yeah. I'm trying to get rid of those those things. Um, and so, you know, this is far. That, that's, more that, 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 that's all I know about it. All right. This is far more refined, beautiful. I think it's going to be, oh, actually, I know it is. It it is on my ordering list this year. It's in my cart right now. I just have to pull the trigger. And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter to talk about metaphors. Bulbs are somewhat unique in gardening in their structure and growth habit. I lump corms and tubers in here too. So let's see, what would be the best metaphor for bulbs? They are essentially an underground storage device. So perhaps I could say, bulbs are the batteries of the horticultural world. No, that that doesn't work. Batteries are useless unless they have a device to power. Hmm. You have to plant bulbs a season or two in advance, and then they sprout and bloom. So perhaps they are an alarm clock. You set them up earlier for the result later. But no, no one really likes an alarm going off, as necessary as it may be. What is something you shut up early only to have the payoff down the road? A savings account. No, that's gradually accumulated and one would hope gradually spent. A time bomb? Well, that's wrong for so many reasons, unless you're a villain. A gift, perhaps. Shopped for in advance, awaiting the occasion of its giving. To provide joy to the giver and the recipient. Well, I'm going to have to go with this one. Because a bulb that grows and blooms doesn't just reward the one who planted it. It also is enjoyed by anyone and everyone who sees it. A gift it is then. 
Man, Peter's getting really Hallmark cardish with his uh, with his little entries into the podcast here. Hey, as long as he doesn't get all Hallmark channel on us, I think we're all set. All right, let's switch the channel to our expert testimony and see who's up next. Hello out there, friends of fine gardening. This is Erin Presley, and I'm a horticulturist at Ulbrich Botanical Gardens up here in Madison, Wisconsin in Zone 5. And I'd like to share with you today some of my thoughts about incorporating unusual or possibly new to you bulbs into your gardens this fall and how to set you up for your success and give you a few recommendations of some of my favorite lesser known bulbs. So a few tips that I always try to remind people as they're making their bulb selections is the number one thing is pay close attention to the cultural recommendations as they're given to you in your bulb catalogs because it's important to remember that most of our garden bulbs come from very punishingly hot and dry climates. And that's why they have developed this bulb as a storage organ to help them um, withstand hot summers by taking their energy and their resources underground and complete their life cycle at other times of the year when the weather is more mild. However, what that translates to in a garden setting is that most of our common bulbs are really looking for a sharply drained full sun site to really thrive. And if you have a location that is a little bit shadier or damper, there's a lot of good options amongst the early narcissus, camassia, species tulips, some of the crocus that can withstand a little bit more moisture or slightly dappled shade. But in general, it's just really important to pay attention to what your plants are looking for to really thrive. And a few slight changes in exposure or moisture conditions in your garden can make the difference between plants that are really like a one-trick pony or have the potential to thrive and naturalize in your garden for years to come. Then in a similar vein is it's important to consider what are the perennial plant companions that you can use to surround your bulbs and really highlight them, not only when they're blooming, but also to help disguise the bulb foliage as it fades. It's really tempting, I know, to go out there in late June and want to just clip back that daffodil foliage and tulips as they're kind of looking ratty and browning out. But the more that you can find early season emerging perennials like penstemon, digitalis, grasses, nepeta, geum, geraniums that can grow over and disguise that foliage as it fades so that you can leave it there and let the bulbs really recharge off of the foliage as it goes dormant um, without having it be unattractive in your garden. That's a really important consideration is what are the other perennials that you're playing off of out there. So one of the relatively unexplored options for early season daffodils for a lot of gardeners are the cyclamineous class of daffodils. And these are early blooming, smaller statured daffs that are relatively adaptable to part shade, which is really helpful because they come up and they do their thing before the trees are really in full leaf. And amongst these, my favorite is really Rapture. And the cyclamineous daffodils get their name um, in their resemblance to a cyclamen because they have a very reflexed petal structure. So think of the cup of the daffodil as looking towards you, and then the perianth behind is swept back. And especially in Rapture, it has a, a long cup. The whole flower is a very bright, cherry yellow. And then the perianth is especially reflexed, so it's swept way behind. And they remind me a lot of little birds that are like flying into a sharp wind, and their feathers are all flying behind them. Bright, crisp yellow looks good in a dappled shade location makes a good accoutrement to sedges in a naturalistic planting style and very cheery addition to the early spring garden. Another of my favorite unexplored classes of major bulbs, so when you think of daffodils and tulips, a little lesser known category of tulip is the multi-flowering or bouquet tulips. And these I really like because 
for each bulb that you plant, the flowering stem actually holds upwards of four smaller flowers. And so you get a little extra flower power for each bulb that you're putting in the ground. They typically bloom about mid-season for tulips, so you're looking for second week of May towards the very beginning of June. And my favorite is um, Antoinette. And I love Antoinette because I feel like you're really getting three different styles of flower in your one bulb purchase. And it kind of reminds me of like a young girl who's maturing into this ravishing young woman. So the flowers come up and the buds initially are a pastel buttery yellow. And then over the two or three week bloom period, as they mature, they take on these raspberry and then ultimately scarlet streaks. And at the end of the bloom cycle, really you're left with just just a very scarlet flash in the garden. And a benefit of those is that since you have several flowers that are all on the same stem, as they become a little bit tattered, if you're standing a little ways away, they still look really great because it's just a bright red flash that is highlighted amongst your other perennials. So Antoinette is a total winner amongst the bouquet flowering tulips. And then another thing to remember at this time of year as you're ordering bulbs is look for bulbs that are not necessarily just spring bloomers. So a good example here are the alliums. And a lot of people are drawn to the very charismatic, larger globed alliums, such as Globe Master or Purple Sensation. But don't forget about some of the smaller scale alliums that are easy to weave into a variety of perennial planting schemes. And my favorite here is Allium Azurium, also known as Blue of the Heavens. And who wouldn't love to go out in their garden and just nonchalantly say, oh yeah, over in that corner I have Blue of the Heavens, just arrived from on high yesterday. It's a really fun, fun Latin name. Central Asian native. These are smaller globes that are about one to two inches in diameter and a cornflower blue blooming in June. The whole plant rises to about 24 inches, so it's easy to weave amongst a variety of perennials. And I especially like it if it's highlighted and backlit by a brighter or lime foliage perennial such as Agasaki Golden Jubilee. Similar to other alliums, it's also not as attractive to deer or rabbits, which is a real selling point. And then another bulb that you should think about incorporating now to get some fun fall color already next year, we're really looking far out now, are autumn crocus. These are a little confusing in their nomenclature because they're actually a different genus than the crocus that you see in the spring. So these are in the genus Colchicum. And the most common of the fall crocus, autumn crocus, is Colchicum autumnal. And the interesting things about this flower is that A, it has its leaves early in the year. So the strappy leaves come up in May to June and are. it's nice to think about how you're going to camouflage those leaves as they come up and then go dormant again amongst a low-growing perennial. I like liriope is a good option. But then in September, you're rewarded with these very ethereal goblet-shaped lilac pink flowers that come up at a height of about six inches. And they're kind of a, they have a silvery sheen and look really otherworldly, especially when they're contrasted with the exuberance and the hot colors of late season Rudbeckia, goldenrods, that sort of thing. It's a really unexpected effect in the garden that you get with the autumn crocus. They also contain some relatively toxic compounds that have been used with medicinal applications over the years. But the flip side of some of those compounds being present in the bulb is they're not very attractive to varmints. So they're less likely to be dug up by squirrels or eaten by rabbits, which is another selling point for a lot of bulbs. 2020 has been 
an interesting year for experienced gardeners to maybe have a little extra time in their garden and attracting some new folks to this great world of gardening that we know and love. And this is a great time to look at bulbs as an idea that represents the potential of our spring next year and a real symbol of hope. And I hope people are finding a way to plant something that is new to them, unusual, gets them excited and gets them out in their garden and looking forward to something next year. So happy planting, y'all. I was really excited to hear what Aaron's uh, picks were from Old Brick Botanic Garden because I've been there in spring and it's a pretty impressive bulb display that they put on there. Yeah, not a, I, I, I was excited. It's great. If, if only we could find bulbs that plant themselves. Too shy. If you've been waiting to become a subscriber of Fine Gardening Magazine, now is the time. Our holiday sales are right around the corner, so check our website frequently and follow us on social media to stay informed on upcoming deals. Go to finegardening.com to see our offers today. Our offers today. Our offers today.